Thank you so much. Uh, we too are very pleased to be at the Barnes. It's a wonderful situ situation to be able to come together with all of the graduate student scholarship uh, in the area. And I'm very pleased to introduce Kaylin M. Jewell, a PhD candidate in the Department of Art History at Tyler School of Art of Temple University. She's currently the recipient of a dissertation completion grant <laughs> awarded by the Graduate School for Architectural Decorum and Aristocratic Power in Late Antiquity, the Gens Anici, under Dr. Elizabeth Bowman, which she will be de defending soon. She has received multiple travel grants for her research, including from the International Center for Medieval Art and the Research Center for Anatolian Civilizations at Koch University in Istanbul, as well as developing substantial digital scholarship expertise through being awarded multiple fellowships in the Center for the Humanities at Temple, the Humanities, Arts, Science, and Technology Alliance and Collaboratory, and in the Digital Scholarship Center in Paley Library at Temple University. This has resulted in a recent publication in Peregrinations, Journal of Medieval Art and Architecture. Kaylin has lectured widely from the College Art Association to specialized conferences such as the annual Byzantine Studies Conference, uh, the famous Kalamazoo International Congress on Medieval Studies, uh, the most recently in which she co-chaired the Italian Art Society sponsored sessions with Amy Gillette here at the Barnes, and her forthcoming appearance at the International Medieval Congress at the University of Leeds for which she received support from the Delaware Valley Medieval Association. She also has been selected as spotlight lecturer uh, in multiple um, capacities at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, this summer, she'll be returning to a Stanford-sponsored archaeology site in Sicily to work as the architectural historian on the Marzamemi Maritime Heritage Project, which is a sixth century shipwreck whose cargo included prefabricated marble architectural sculpture intended for the construction of a church. Please join me in welcoming Kaylin Jewell to speak on topographies of aristocratic power in the late antique Mediterranean. Kaylin. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Thanks to the Barnes. Thanks to everybody for attending today. In 413 CE, Bishop Aurelius of Carthage bestowed a sacred veil upon the head, there we go, upon the head of a young woman named Demetrios, who, along with her family, had fled Rome in the aftermath of the Visigothic sack of the city a few years earlier. Through this ritual, known as the Velatio, Demetrios became a consecrated virgin of the church, and her family reaped the benefits of having produced this so-called living martyr. Several decades later, Demetrios moved back to Rome where she was responsible for the construction of a church dedicated to the first of the martyrs, St. Stephen, which was located on the Via Latina. Nearly a century later, in the city of Constantinople, a relative of Demetrios, a woman named Anikia Juliana, built a church dedicated to St. Polyuktos, a monument whose ostentatiousness might have prompted Emperor Justinian to build Hagia Sophia. These churches, Rome's Santo Stefano and Constantinople's St. Polyuktos, provide just two examples of the, of the architectural patronage of the Gens Anikii, a legendarily powerful family known primarily through the textual and epigraphic record. Described by scholars as having had a tentacular role in the political and religious life of the late antique Mediterranean, the Anikia's, the Anikia's widespread topography of power is clearly visible in the appearance of inscriptions across the empire, as we can see in this heat map where red, where red areas indicate a high epigraphic frequency. Use, useful as this visual, visualization is in terms of placing individual Anikii in specific geographical locations, what it cannot demonstrate are the motivations behind these widespread topographies of power and how they appeared on the ground. It is the goal of this paper to explore these concentrated nodes of Anikian authority to reveal how individual members of the family impacted the fabric of urban centers with an emphasis placed upon Rome and Constantinople. 
More specifically, I discuss Dimitrios's Santo Stefano and Anikia Giuliana's St. Polyuctos and their roles in the cultivation of an aristocratic decorum of architecture that provided these Anikian women with visible topographies of power within the politically tumultuous transformation of the Roman Empire during the fifth, during the fifth and sixth centuries CE. Dur through a thorough consideration of the archeological and textual records, I argue that the construction of these buildings, often strategically dedicated, located, and decorated, served as physical markers of a distinctly aristocratic authority. We begin at the third mile of Rome's Via Latina, where today we find a very lovely, quiet archeological park. Please go, it's lovely. Um, lining the ancient road is a series of impressive ancient mausolea, a few of which contain wonderfully preserved examples of Roman imperial de funerary decoration. Tucked into the northeastern corner of this park are the remains of a roofless rectangular structure, which now functions as a storeroom for the materials excavated from the surrounding area. It is this unassuming monument that marks the site of Demetrios' church, dedicated to St. Stephen. The precise date of construction for Santo Stefano is hard to pin down, as is common for many late antique monuments. We are fortunate, therefore, that the Liber Pontificalis makes reference to it in an entry on Pope Leo the Great. Quote, God, God's handmaid Demetrios built a basilica to St. Stephen on her estate at the third mile of the Via Latina. This places the monument's erection tentatively during the pontificate of Leo I between 440 and 461. Further evidence for this, for this dating was discovered during 19th century excavations at the site conducted by the Pontifical Commission for Sacred Archaeology under the direction of Lorenzo Fortunati. In 1857, after archaeologists rediscovered the remains of a large villa complex on the Via Latina, he and his team uncovered a large fragmentary inscription. This reconstruction confirms the, it was reconstructed and which confirms the association with Pope Leo and the fifth century date. The first two lines read, quote, when the Amnian virgin Demetrios leaving this world brought to a close her last day, yet not truly dying, she gave to you, Pope Leo, these final vows that this sacred house arise. These references are useful not only in dating the monument, but they reveal an interesting and often remarked upon facet of Demetrios's life, her virginity. Clearly, this is something that was important enough to her identity that she wanted to carve it into the material fabric of her church and that the compilers of the Liber Pontificalis wanted to emphasize in their entry on Pope Leo the Great. Given that we know many elite women of the fourth and fifth centuries chose to renounce the secular world in favor of a life devoted to Christ, why was Demetrios' decision to do the same so remarkable? If we look more closely at some of these women, like Paula and Markella, who congregated in sumptuous palace complexes, unfortunately now lost, um, which were located on Rome's Aventine Hill, we find that they often made the conversion to the spiritual life as a result of becoming widows. Demetrios, on the other hand, was unmarried when she received the Velatio in 413. Although we do not have first-to-hand accounts of Demetrios' ceremony, veiling ceremony, scholars like Natalie Henry and Peter Brown have reconstructed what must have been a very elaborate and conspicuously public occasion. Taking place in Carthage, the event would have occurred in Rome if the city had not been sacked by the Visigoths in 410. Given the prestige of the Anikii and their close ties to the North African provinces, the event was likely well attended. According to Brown, the festivities that marked the ritual would have resembled the spectacles associated with the debut of a senator or consul, which we can see depicted in the lower portions of these late antique ivory diptychs. In addition to the senatorial and consular overtones, an echo of Roman marriage ritual was present in the bestowal of a veil by the bishop upon Demetrius, analogous to the veiling of the bride during the Roman wedding ceremony. Comparisons can also be made um, between consecrated virgins like Demetrios and the Vestal Virgins of pre-Christian Rome, as both were sworn through ritual to uphold their celibacy in the service of a deity. Yet unlike the Vestals, who could age out of their celibate lifestyle, the consecrated virgins of Christianity had to maintain their status for the rest of their lives. The preservation of the perpetual virginity of these women became a significant preoccupation of several late antique theologians, including Ambrose of Milan, Augustine of Hippo, Pelagius, and Jerome. Ambrose, in particular, wrote an entire treatise with instructions for newly consecrated virgins and how they should comport themselves. 
which opened with a comparison between them and the virgin martyrs like St. Agnes, who we see here in a seventh century mosaic from Rome. In this remarkable passage, Ambrose wrote, quote, virginity is not praiseworthy because it is found in the martyrs, because, but because it itself makes martyrs. He followed this with a discussion aimed towards parents of these women who might be apprehensive to take their daughters out of the pool of eligible brides, as they were useful agents in the formation of strategic marriage alliances. Of this, Ambrose stated, quote, parents will refuse a dowry, but you have a wealthy bridegroom, and content with the riches of his ancestral inheritance, you shall not want for gain. How much more excellent is chaste poverty than a large dowry, end quote. Of course, the bridegroom to whom Ambrose referred was surely Christ, but it is easy to see how the marriage language could have been attractive to families like the Anikii who continued to seek traditional Roman alliances in the newly Christianized aristocracy. Let us return to Demetrios' church on the Via Latina in Rome, built in the decades following her Velazio in Carthage. Although the building was associated with Pope Leo, the choice of St. Stephen for the dedication was entirely up to Demetrios and probably resulted from her close contact with Augustine of Hippo, the man who was ultimately responsible for the arrival of St. Stephen's relics in North Africa in 416 CE, three short years after their miraculous discovery in the Holy Land. Not only would St. Stephen have been on Demetrios' mind given her time spent in North Africa, I suggest that she could have viewed his transformation from deacon to martyr as a reminder of her own conversion from eligible bride into a consecrated virgin, the so -called, a so-called living martyr. Furthermore, the location of Santo Stefano within the walls of her family's villa, which at the time continued to be filled with classical sculpture, was also within view of an ancient necropolis that imbued Demetrios's church complex with a funerary aspect, appropriate for a personal monument dedicated to a martyred Christian saint. The juxtaposition of the newly built Christian church alongside pagan mausolea would not have been entirely jarring given the late antique trend to place monumental ecclesiastical architecture over the burials of Christian saints. Yet the almost triumphal rise of Demetrios's church admittedly hard to visualize given its current state of ruin, among the ancient tombs of the pagan past could serve as a reminder to Demetrios and her family of the grace associated with Stephen's final words as he prayed for the mob that had stoned him to death. Quote, then he kneeled down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. In his last moments on earth, Stephen did not curse his murderers or ask for their destruction. Instead, he prayed for their salvation. In a similar way, we have no evidence that Demetrios or her builders sought to destroy the monumental markers of the vibrantly pagan past that surrounded her church. Rather, she chose to leave them intact and perhaps hoped her architectural votive offering to St. Stephen would sanctify the site. Shifting to the Eastern Mediterranean city of Constantinople and nearly a century later in the sixth century, Demetrios' relative, Anikia Juliana, rebuilt her family's church dedicated to St. Polyuctos. Although the building no longer survives, its massive foundations were rediscovered in Istanbul's Sarachane district during a 1960 road expansion project. Located along the northern branch of Constantinople's main ceremonial route between the Philadelphion and the Church of the Holy Apostles, the subsequent archeological excavations uncovered an enormous amount of finely carved architectural sculpture that articulated the monument's interior. The building was large, as this site plan demonstrates, and internally measured 50, approximately 50 by 50 meters square. According to Jonathan Bardell's reconstructed plan, the, the nave was lined on either side by a series of three large semicircular spaces, which would have been somewhat similar in form to those found in the Naus of San Vitale in Ravenna, albeit with five arches instead of three. Crowning the side and central arches of these spaces were peacocks whose tail feathers unfurled over their bodies in a physical gesture of display to create the form of a semi-dome. On the soffits of the arches between the semi-domes were two pairs of confronting peacocks, their tails also raised above their heads. And in this fragment from the Istanbul Archaeology Museum, we can see that their tails nearly touched at the arch's midpoint, which we can see right here, so the tops of their tails. In total, the archaeological record suggests that there were over 40 of these sculptural birds. 
that an elite woman living in 6th century Constantinople would choose to install peacock imagery in, in a church interior is not, and in and of itself, remarkable, given the ubiquity of the motif in late antiquity, as we can see in these um, extant examples. Yet the sheer number and repetition of these birds inside a single church is surprising and can remind us of what Professor Dale Kinney has described as a, quote, discourse of display, whereby magnanimity or magnificentia could be amplified through the replication of specific forms. In addition to the sculptural peacocks at St. Polyuctos, a full page illumination of a peacock displaying his tail feathers appears in the opening pages of the 6th century Vienna Dioscorides, a manuscript that was given to Juliana as a votive offering from a suburban Constantinopolitan citizenship, um, group of citizens for her generous donation um, of a church. The unconventional posture of these birds facing outward towards the viewer is striking for it breaks with much more common depictions in profile surrounded by vine scrolls and often flanking vessels or reeds as we can see in this example from Egypt, now on display in the map. While scholars have repeatedly interpreted the appearance of these birds as terrestrial symbols for the beauty and abundance of heavenly paradise, I argue that Juliana's peacocks should be understood as visual markers of display that recalled the aristocratic Romanitas of their Anikian ancestry. Their installation along the length of St. Polyuctos's nave created a gauntlet of male peacocks raising their feathers in highly conspicuous gestures of display for those that process towards the altar. In a politically charged moment when the Anikii were being overlooked in favor of the fresh-faced Justinianic dynasty, St. Polyuctos and its ostentatious decoration served as a reminder to viewers, including Emperor Justinian, who visited the church, um, of the power and authority of old Roman families like the Anikii. From this discussion of both Demetrius's basilica dedicated to St. Stephen in Rome and Anikia Juliana's church of St. Polyuctos in Constantinople, we can begin to understand how aristocratic families like the Anikii used the patronage of architecture to position themselves within the highest echelons of late Roman society. These buildings, thoughtfully dedicated, strategically located, and purposefully decorated, each served to concretize the power of their aristocratic patrons. In historical moments racked by war, plague, and political instability, the, finan the finance and construction of solid, immovable buildings like Santo Stefano and St. Polyuctos afforded aristocrats, arist aristocrats like those of the Genzanikii with a sense of permanence and stability that they hoped would last in perpetuity. Thank you. Thank you.